<coughs> All right. So let's talk about outer game. OK, so I'm going to give you guys some techniques and specifics. These are just basically going to be a lot of the biggest things that guys do wrong in outer game. But before I give you the specifics, I want to tell you the overarching principle of outer game. And I've kind of gotten to this with, it, it's, it's based on a lot of the stuff I've said before. Um, but good outer game is designed to convey evolutionary attractive qualities. OK? So outer game. Um, it's like, right? It's, it's showing that you are that alpha in society. Outer game is basically showing that you are that in demand 1% of guys that have the abundance, have all the girls into them. That's what you're doing with outer game. Um, and again, if you are already that guy, it's helpful. Um, but even if you're that guy on a cold approach or in a situation where you're just meeting someone, if you don't actively show it to them, they have no way to know it. Doesn't matter how cool you are, it matters how cool you allow them to see that you are. Okay? So if you're the coolest guy ever and you walk up to a girl and you have a, a small talk conversation and you never let her know that it's a man to woman interaction, you're never gonna get anywhere. You have to actually broach that. Um, so that's absolutely critical. Right? But it is all about conveying those characteristics. So everything we do is, is conveying those characteristics one way or another. So here are these are very, very simple, but they are the things you can do in outer game more than anything else that will get you results. Number one, talk, talk louder, right? Everybody in this room probably already knows that. However, how many people in this room actually do it? Nobody's handling it. Good, couple, right? To a certain extent. One of the biggest things that I see over and over again, especially on the open, but throughout an interaction. Hi, excuse me. Are you, oh, oh shit, never mind. I guess she didn't like me. All right? You have to, first of all, you have to be heard. But secondly, even beyond just being heard, talking loud conveys good things about you. Okay? If you talk loud to someone, it conveys you have certainty in what you're saying. If you talk quietly, it conveys you lack certainty in what you're saying. Right? So if I walk up to you, I'm like, hey, um, I thought you were cute. I, I wanted to meet you. Right? What does that say? It says, I'm not sure of myself. I'm nervous. It also quite possibly says, I'm afraid of other people hearing this. Right? If you're afraid of people hearing what you're saying, what does that say? I'm creepy. Right? I'm afraid of people hearing this because I'm ashamed of what I'm doing and what I'm doing is creepy. If you walk up to a girl and the first thing that's being subcommunicated is I'm creepy, do you think she's going to respond well to you? Absolutely not. Whereas if you go in and you're a little too loud, it's fine, right? Now maybe you draw a little bit of attention. Oh, I'm sorry, that was, that was a little over the top. Hi, nice to meet you. You tone it down and you're fine, right? At least you've conveyed you're confident. You've conveyed you're okay with whatever's going on. And if you get a lot of social attention on you, fine. You should be okay with that as well. That's the other thing you're conveying by being loud is um, you're conveying actual social proof, okay? You're conveying that you've had good responses throughout your life. Because if you go in and you speak loudly in front of a group, you're saying to everyone there, the times in the past in my life where I've spoken loudly, people have responded well to me. Right? You're conveying that you're an attractive, popular person by virtue of the volume of your voice. That's it. Okay? If you go in and you speak quietly, you're conveying, the times that I've drawn attention to myself before didn't work out very well for me. So I'm going to talk to you like this now. Right? It's not conveying a lot of good things. Not conveying good things. So very, very important, talk louder. Single biggest thing almost everybody could do to be better at game. Um, next. That's not very well written, but it says statements, not questions, if you can read off the side of the page. Statements, not questions. Okay, if I ask questions, especially the typical boring questions that most people ask, what I'm essentially doing is I'm asking the girl to be interesting, because I'm not. Okay? If you walk up to a girl and you say, where are you from? What do you do? How old are you? Oh, cool. Um, so do you like what you do? Cool. Um, and where were you from before that? And how many brothers and sisters do you have? Right? You're doing a couple things. Number one, you're being really boring. She's heard all those questions before, hundreds if not thousands of times. She's probably tired of answering them. 
right? If you talk to people a lot, like I talk to a lot of people. I meet a lot of people in a cold approach situation. When girls ask me what I do for a living, that's actually a good moment in the set. Like that means that they're bought in and they want to know me. You know what I do? I groan internally. Because I'm like, fuck, this question again? I'm like so bored with my own answer to this question. Right? And that's me knowing that when they ask this, I'm a step closer to sex. Okay? As, like a, as a nice, virile, horny man. Even there, I'm groaning at the question. So you can imagine what a girl who's being hit on all the time, oftentimes by a guy she doesn't want to be hit on by, and ask these questions, how she must feel. Okay? Have you ever told them, oh, I'm so bored with my answer to this question, when they ask that? Yeah, sometimes. I, I, wouldn't say, I wouldn't say it quite that way, but yeah, I've said, I've said essentially that message in a different way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, uh, pff, I don't even feel like telling you, like, let's, we don't even know each other, let's, I'll answer that in like half an hour. Let's, ask, let's talk about something more interesting. I've done that before. Um, or I'll be like, um, you know what, I'm just going to give you a bullshit answer, like, because I'm just tired of like, I'm tired of explaining this, so here's some bullshit, right? I've done that before. Um, whatever, whatever keeps you engaged in the conversation is actually better than whatever is good game, right? The inner game always trumps the outer game. However, you can have, if, you have, <clears throat> if you can have both, that's good, right? That's what you ideally want. Um, okay, well, statements rather than questions. So most questions are asked out of a lack of something to say. Most questions come out of, oh shit, I like this person, I wish this conversation would keep going, but I don't really know what to say. So, um, where are you from? <laughs> right? That's how it mostly comes out, and that's exactly how it comes off. Okay? I like, uh, where are you from? Just kidding, so. Fair enough. Okay, so, they what you want to do, time. what you want to do in general, is offer your own value and your own unique perspective. Remember, your value comes from your values. So the more that you convey who you are and what you're about, the better off you're going to do. So little things you can do in terms of statements, not questions. If you were to ask a question, what you can do is turn it into a statement. So instead of where you're from, which is boring and doesn't offer much and means that you have to provide whatever is interesting, I could say, you know what, you don't seem like an LA person. It's kind of an interesting vibe you have, right? That's more interesting. It's not like the world's best game move, but it's more interesting than where are you from. See the difference? Because when I say you don't seem like an LA person, there's a lot of my own ideas in that. Right? There's, I perceive him in a certain way. He might be curious as to what that is. Or I say you don't seem like an LA person. Well, what's an LA person? What's your perspective on that? Right? I've at least conveyed some of my own perspective. The other way that you can handle this is you can do questions and turn them into statements. So for example, actually ask, answer this time, where are you from? Indiana. Indiana? Oh, fuck, dude. That must have been terrible. Like, there's, like, there's a reason they call that a flyover state. Fuck. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry for you. Right? So what did I do? I had like an opinion about it. Right? Or if I'm feeling a little nicer, where are you from? Indiana. Oh, I fucking love that place. There's such like, people are so much more genuine there. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like it's, it's, it's less bullshit than like the coasts. So it's, it's very cool. You're like salt of the earth. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Cool. Are you salty? A little bit, sometimes. <laughs> Don't even go there. Okay, so anyway, the point is, like, I just made it more interesting, okay? So I took that, that boring question, and whatever the answer is, I at least had an opinion, had some feedback about it. But the key part of game, again, is expressing yourself, expressing your attractive qualities as fast as possible, and questions just don't do it, okay? For the most part. Um, and the reason I say statements, not questions, is not actually because questions are inherently bad, but because most people ask boring questions as filler. There actually are questions that are good. Um, here's an interesting question. Um, so say you find out what somebody did for a living, and you say, oh, that's interesting. Um, like say they're a doctor or whatever. So you're like, you know what, um, I, I always have this, this interesting perspective on doctors. Were you the girl that like in kindergarten you stood up and you're like, I want to be a doctor? Or is it something you came to later? Because I feel like there's really two different classes. Which are you? Does that make sense? That's a question she hasn't heard before, and it's a question that actually is a little deeper. Force her to think actually is about getting to know her. And by the way, I'm not saying this is a question you should all ask right now, but it's a question you should maybe ask if you find the answer interesting. Right? If you're actually intrigued by that question, then by all means ask it. But don't ask it because I'm intrigued by it. Okay? Ask what you genuinely want to know yourself. Okay? Right? So, or for example, it, it can be even rude, but sometimes I'll ask people, like, did you get into that because your parents like, made you, or did you actually want to do that yourself? Right? It's a little bit rude even, but it's my own unique perspective, it's conveying my personality, it's challenging them, it's being willing to walk away, it's not being attached to the outcome, so it actually conveys a lot of good things, even if it is a little rude. It's genuine too. 
It is. It will, assuming it's assuming I, I actually mean it and actually care, then yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. So statements rather than questions. Or more importantly than this, it's this. Convey you. Convey you. And it's this. Assume the burden. There's that moment at the start of the conversation when the conversation hasn't really begun and somebody has to take the initiative to make it happen, right? Um, have you ever that, that moment when you're standing in line next to a hot girl and like you wanna say something and you know, you, she might even like be looking over and you can kinda, you know, maybe she even would like to say something, but nothing's gonna happen unless you take the initiative and start it, right? And then maybe you say something and she kinda laughs and like, haha, that's funny anyway. Haha, that's funny, that's so cool. And then she kind of doesn't know what to say, and so she nervously goes back to just, and you know, if you were to continue it, you probably could do something, but there's that, that moment of impetus. You have to do something again, right? Um, you have to assume the burden. You have to take responsibility for the conversation starting because she won't. Because um, let's look at, um, is it, did I talk about this yet? Okay, that's actually the next is female psychology. We'll talk about that in a second, female psychology. Um, but female psychology, basically, she can't be a slut. If she were to help you sleep with her too much, she's a little too slutty. So she can't really. So you have to assume the burden. <clears throat> the way I look at it is a little bit like starting a lawnmower. Like, you know those old school, I don't, I don't even know, I've mowed the lawn in so long, but um, those like old school, when I was a kid, lawnmowers where like you pull the choke and it like starts and then dies, and then starts and then dies. And like, it doesn't even make sense. Like the 10th pull, it finally works or whatever, right? But you just have to keep fucking pulling it. Right? It's the same thing with conversation sometimes. You say that one little thing and the conversation, blah, 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 silence. Then you have to like assume the burden and say something else and blah, 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 oh, silence. And then at some point, the motor just starts running and the conversation just goes organically, right? But you have to assume the burden at the start. Um, so that's the other thing you're doing with statements, not questions. I'll take quickly if they're on topic, yeah. yeah so you're saying that uh, you're trying to be more of a talkative force in the conversation throughout? Just at the start. You have to, you have to do, think of it this way. There's like the, um, draw a little, uh, we'll do it on a different page just because. Um, so think of it this way. So this is like time, energy. Um, so let's call this like the energy threshold. And so at the start, there's like no energy. You have to put in some energy, and then it'll go back down. You put in some energy, it'll go back down. And then you get it above the, you put in some energy, it goes back, and then you get it above this threshold, and then all of a sudden, it just goes. Does that make sense? So here, you have to keep putting in energy. Once you get it above that threshold and you, she's really participating, then you're actually better off sitting back and doing less of the work and letting her do more of the work, letting her get more invested. But she won't start investing until you at least get it above that sort of threshold. Make sense? Cool. Yeah. Um, well, don't you think it's a bunch of variables? Because like, sometimes I notice that in day game, um, I just do one thing mm -hmm. and they respond. Mm -hmm. like, there's, like there's a pregnant pause, but they assume the burden. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I have to like continue it. So it's like, is there like a sweet spot or is there like... It's calibration. Right. It's calibration. Like, so you go in and you pause and then they go with it sometimes. Or sometimes you go in, you pause, and then it goes back down and then you have to go again. And then, right. you know, it's just calibration. Um, it's okay to leave some pauses. And in fact, I do leave some pauses, but I don't leave so much of a pause that it completely dies at the start. Yeah. Um, cool. All right. So... So reasons for statements, not questions. One, convey you, right? It's all about conveying your values and conveying who you actually are. Two is you need to assume the burden. Oh. Yeah. Okay, so I don't know if anyone else has this issue, but rather than running out of things to say, I usually just never stop talking. And I usually don't know where to like stop or kind of see if, because a lot of times I'll get the response to <laughs> anything. So I'll just we'll talk about that. We'll talk about that maybe the last, last slide on, this, on today and we're gonna talk about it a lot, a lot tomorrow. So we'll really get to that. Um, but yeah, that is a problem, for sure. Um, one quick thing I'll say is just leave micro silences, right? So instead of like going completely silent, instead of like, blah, 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 blah. It's just gonna die eventually, right? Instead, um, hey, you know what's so interesting about that? Actually, wait, where are you from, quickly? Because I have a reason why I ask. LA. Yeah? Cool. Um, so actually something really interesting yeah, we can talk about it, right? You said yeah, I leave like little pauses, right? That, that wasn't like the best example of the timing of it. But what I can do is, say if I make a statement, okay? If I make a statement and you don't respond, instead of talking over it, I'll make you respond. 
So like, don't when I ask you the question, don't respond immediately. Okay, so I'm like, um, I'm gonna guess you're not from around here. Yeah, the reason I say that is blah 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 blah. So you see how I gave him a chance to respond, but then I also didn't leave it so long. Like I didn't go. I'm gonna say you're not from around here. <laughs> Right, I, didn't, I don't leave it five minutes, right? I leave it long enough that it's clear, like I put some social pressure on, I expect a response, but then if he doesn't respond, I continue to assume the burden because it's kind of a cooperative effort, right? It's like, um, game is, uh, here's an interesting, another interesting model. Do you guys know the idea of, do you guys know what a zero sum game is? Does anybody know what this is? A zero sum, okay. So I'll give you this as well. We'll go back to that, that, that page in a minute. Um, so there's, there's different types of games. There's, um, we'll start with a zero sum game, because that's the easiest to go from, and then the others make sense. So a zero sum game is like a basketball game, or a game of chess, or something like that, where for every winner, there's also a loser, right? So if you're playing a zero sum game against someone, everything that's good for you is bad for them, period. Okay, that's it. Zero sum game, for every winner, there is a loser. Um, and there are aspects of game that are a little bit zero-sum in a way. It's like your frame is strong or her frame is strong and one frame wins or the other frame loses or whatever, right? So it does have zero-sum aspects to it, but if game is zero-sum, you're gonna do very badly. If for you to win, she has to lose, you're not gonna sleep with a whole lot of girls, all right? So the other types of games there are, there's positive-sum games. Positive-sum game is something like a negotiation. So say for example that, um, say you and I are gonna negotiate. And I really like hamburgers and you really like potatoes. And I have you know, three hamburgers and three potatoes, you have three hamburgers and three potatoes, and we negotiate and you take all the potatoes, I take all the hamburgers, and we're both happier than we were at the start. That's what game should be like. It's a positive sum game, right? However, so that, that's where you got all the potatoes and I got all the hamburgers, that's a very positive sum. However, what if we negotiate, I negotiate a little bit better and now I get all the hamburgers and two of the potatoes, and you just get one of the potatoes. You get your three plus one of my potatoes. Right? So now, it's still positive sum. You still got more potatoes than you had before, so you're still happy, but it's even more the zero sum aspect of the game, the competitive aspect. I kind of won more than you did. Make sense? Everybody won, but I won more. Right? So that's a positive sum game where, where everybody wins. And then there's also negative sum games um, where everybody loses. And technically, if you win enough, you could still win in a negative sum game, but you just generally don't want to play those. Okay? That's games where, like, for example, gambling, like poker, is a negative sum game. The house takes a cut, so on average, all the players lose. But if you're a really good player, you can win enough to overcome the house cut. Right? But anyway, um, so game should be a positive sum game. Okay? It should be, it'd be a situation where everybody benefits. And then if you happen to benefit a little more, fine. But you're, you're providing good things, you're providing value to everybody in life. Um, okay, uh, where were we? All right, so back to this. <laughs> so, tactics of outer game. Number one, talk louder. Number two, statements, not questions. Number three, leading. You have to lead, you have to take charge. Again, the girl won't lead, we'll get into that in a second when we talk about social conditioning. Is if she leads, it makes her a slut. Also, though, leading conveys a lot of attractive qualities about you. If you're willing to take a lead, same as how talking louder, it conveys that you've had good, um, good social acceptance when you've talked louder. If you're willing to take a lead, it conveys you've had good social acceptance when you've taken the lead. Right? When you've led in the past, things have gone well for you. So the very act of leading is high value, even if it's pointless. Right? Even if it's just you're, you're in, the, in the club and you're like, hey, uh, let's go stand over here for a second. Hey, actually, let's go sit down. Even if it doesn't get you closer to anything, the fact that you are leading, the fact that you have a direction and you're being assertive actually makes you more attractive. Better yet, if you're leading towards an outcome, right? If you want to take a girl home, moving her closer to the door, moving her away from her friends where you can talk more, more intimately, um, these type of things are actually positive as well, right? So leading has, has tactical reasons as well, um, and that's another good reason to do it. But leading for its own sake is high value, right? Also, leading the conversation is high value. If you talk about the things you want to talk about, that's a high value thing. If you get sucked into talking about a bunch of things you don't care about because she was talking about them, that's a low value type of a frame. Right? If you hate, if she's talking about purses and handbags and you hate that shit and you're sitting there nodding your head, 
and she can tell you're bored and just going along, you're losing value by the second, right? If on the other hand you interrupt that and say actually you know what's really interesting and throw in some stuff you actually care about, now you're leading and that, that act of leading, that act of decision and initiative actually will be attractive because again it's an, it's an alpha male quality, right? In a tribal situation, you don't lead if you're a beta because you'll get like smacked down. So the very, the very fact that you're willing to lead conveys a lot of positive qualities. Um, next one we talked about, we talked about this a little bit, frame and frame control. Okay, so frame and frame control. Um, frame, basically, I, I kind of used the term before, but I didn't really define it. Frame is the viewpoint that controls the meaning of events. Okay, so if you look at things through different viewpoints, their meaning has changed. Um, frame is, this comes from uh, the science of neurolinguistic programming. Uh, and here's a classic example to illustrate frame from that science. <clears throat> so let's say you're driving down the street and um, an ambulance cuts you off in traffic, blaring siren, you have to stop, and it's inconvenienced you ever so slightly. Are you like pissed off at the ambulance? Probably not. For the most part, people aren't really pissed. They understand like it's doing its job, saving lives, it's what it's supposed to do, whatever. People may be like mildly, mildly annoyed, but no big deal, right? Let's say now behind that ambulance, there's like a bright red sports car weaving through traffic, cutting behind the ambulance that like cuts you off as, as it goes through. How do you feel about the guy in the sports car? Fuck the sports car, asshole, asshole etc. Okay. So you just got cut off just as much, but because it's the, the sports car instead of the ambulance, now you're pissed off, right? Because you're framing it in a different way, right? You're not framing it as he's doing good. You're framing it as, oh, he's taking advantage of the situation. What a scumbag. What an asshole. Also, like, because it's the red sports car, like, fucking elitist, whatever, right? All right. Now, what if you somehow knew that inside the ambulance is his like pregnant wife who's having a complication and he wants to be there by his side when she gets or by her side when she gets to the hospital oh, to care for her his wife how would you feel about him then dedicated sports car is okay sports <laughs> car okay right yeah. so now all of a sudden you've changed the viewpoint through which you're seeing the events so the events themselves have changed their meaning for you okay so that's what a frame is okay um, and again the frame around everything's important if your frame in a pickup is I've come here to manipulate you and fuck you and give nothing in return, the girl's probably not going to like that very much, right? But if your frame is, I, I want to meet you, I think we have a good time together, and you know, regardless, it'll be fun finding out, that's a much more acceptable frame to the girl, right? Or if the frame, if you want to go more arrogant, is, um, hi, I'm here to enhance your life through my presence, right? If she accepts that frame, that's a very positive, good frame for you, okay? Um, and there are some frames that are positive, some frames that are negative. Uh, and we'll talk a lot, especially tomorrow and, and at the end of today, about what those frames are that are positive. But the big thing is to have some control over the frame and to, um, to not get into the bad frames, not to get into the frames that aren't helping your cause and to put yourself in the ones that are. Uh, final thing about frame control itself is if, frame, if someone knows they're being frame controlled, they don't like it. So if you're going to do frame control right, it has to be subtle. The nature of frame control is it has to be subtle. <laughs> All right? um, it's like if, um, if an ad came on TV and the ad said, your life is shit and I want to sell you stuff, so I'm going to convince you you're like an awful person so that you buy my product, so now buy my product. Would, you, would anybody buy that? No. It's because like, the frame control is being put in your face. It's like I'm trying to frame control you. It's very obvious. It's manipulative. Nobody wants to be manipulated. Right? However, if on the other hand, it's a really cool, interesting, funny commercial with these beautiful peoples in a scenic location, and you're kind of looking at it and thinking, oh, I wish I was them, and then there's a product in the commercial, you might be swayed to maybe view that product in a better light. Right? But in that case, the frame control is very subtle. Right? It's not this in-your-face, like, I'm manipulating you frame control. It's done in a way that is amusing, humorous, maybe artistic. Um, you have a positive association with it, a positive, ex positive experience of, but it still gets the message across, okay? Similarly, when you talk to a girl, your frame control should be that. So a lot of times when you are con communicating these, these frames of, of like higher value or of man to woman, if you do it in a flirtatious way, in a joking way, in a lighthearted way, as opposed to in a judgmental way or a serious way or a logical way, you're going to do much, much, much better, right? Specifically, um, there's a reason why when the girl gives you a shit test, you don't respond to it logically. 
because responding so logic, responding logically is like manipulative frame control. All right? If a girl's like, "Is that your pickup line?" and you go, "Actually, looking at it logically, you should be happy that I'm picking you up because the fact that men do pick you up illustrates that you know you're still an attractive girl, and in like 10 or 20 years." guys probably won't pick you up as much, and that'll be a sad day for you. So you should actually be really happy that I came and talked to you. Right? <laughs> now, <laughs> that's, that's, that might logically kind of hold weight. Do you think that's going to get a really good response from the girl? Probably not. If you did it in a joke, though. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, if you, could, if you could do it as a joke. Or if, if yeah, exactly. Um, but if you do it in that logical, didactic way, she'll be like, she'll be like, yeah, you're probably right. You're also an asshole, and I don't like you. Bye. <laughs> right? doing it playfully. <laughs> um, it'd be hard to do all that in one playful sentence. Um, but if she's like, if she's like, is that your pickup line? You'd be like, in this case, I suppose it was, yeah. Right? Or um, if she says, is that your pickup line? But whoa, 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 pickup, let's slow down. Let's, let's start with conversation. We can get the feelings involved later. I want to get to know you first. Right? That kind of stuff. Right? That's like a classic kind of a way. But it's this sort of like playful, don't care kind of thing. Right? Or like, oh, pick up, wow, you move fast, girl. All right, well, I'm glad you like me. Um, let's start with names, I'm Todd, right? And you just psh, throw it. So that's a more playful, less like upfront in your face way, okay? But if you're trying to answer these things logically, if you're trying to assert your frame too strongly, it just comes across as manipulative and it's no good. So understand, frame's important, but the way you control it is equally important. If you're controlling it too obviously and it comes off manipulative, that's actually almost worse than having a bad frame. Um, Finally, let's talk about the most common technical tactics in game, which are these. Push pull. This qualification. Okay. <laughs> push pull and disqualification. Um, push pull basically is where you give a compliment and then take it away within a very short period of time. For example, if I was like, I love that shirt, but just a little too try hard, man. I just, I don't know, right? So the positive is I love the shirt, the negative is a little try hard. Like you have the weirdest expression on your face right now, but you're clearly trying to learn, so I respect that, right? Negative, but a positive. So that's a push pull, right? Or with girls, you know, there's something about you that I love, but there's something about you that I fucking totally hate as well. I just, I don't know. I don't know what to think about you, right? That's a push pull. Okay, uh, and these kind of statements <clears throat> are good for a number of different reasons. Um, disqualification has similar elements, but let's talk about push pull first. What is push pull all about? <coughs> um, okay, so well, let's do this. Let's call this the normal range of experience right here. And I'm gonna ask you guys a question to kind of illustrate this. How many people remember their drive here? Okay. How many people remember it really vividly and exactly? Maybe kind of a little bit. Okay, cool. How many people remember their drive to work or school or wherever they go on a regular basis today? even fewer, okay? Now, we were all present for that. We were all like, we all had our attention on it enough to not crash, right? But why is it that we don't remember it? It's because it's a very normal experience. It doesn't stand out for us, right? And a lot of the experiences, in fact, most of the experiences in our life fall into that normal range of experience. How many people remember your first day of the job that you're at right now? Or remember some things about it? Cool. How many people remember um, what they did at work last Tuesday. No, even though that's more recent. Why? Because that first day on the job, it was all new and different, and so it registered as an event in your mind. When you've been going for years and years and years, and it's just a random Tuesday, it doesn't register as an event, it's in this normal range. <clears throat> Most people's interactions stick in that normal range. And that's why you can talk to a girl, and it'll be totally pleasant, she'll be totally nice, she'll be friendly, but it just doesn't go anywhere. You get like some number that just flakes later and she barely remembers who you are, or maybe she like at the end of 20 minutes, she's like, oh, nice to meet you, and leaves, right? You just didn't get outside that normal range of experience. It wasn't bad, but it just wasn't good enough to be memorable. Now, let's say that you're really complimentary. So this is, we'll call this positive and negative. 
So let's say that you are really complimentary, and so you're like saying these things that are like positive outside of the range of normal experience, right? So now you're going to get noticed. You're getting noticed, um, and this is what I call nice guy. This is a guy that's really nice, really complimentary. The girl knows he likes her, and she appreciates it. She's flattered by it, but he's a little too obvious, and it actually becomes boring in a way too because it's so predictable. It's so predictably positive. Also, when you're positive all the time, people may even distrust your positivity. Right? If I get, if I compliment, if I walked in here, let's say I just came in here and you guys all know me from, from YouTube or from wherever, and you're like, you know, want to come see me. And I come in and I give him a really good compliment. You probably feel really good about yourself, right, at that moment. Okay, cool. Now what if I then give you a really good compliment? I give you a really good compliment. I give you a really good compliment. You're a really good compliment. How do you guys feel about your compliments now that I'm complimenting everybody else in the room too? It's disingenuous, right? It's just some bullshit. It wasn't actually earned. It doesn't mean anything, right? A lot of guys that are really nice like this, it comes off that way. It comes off actually like a coping strategy. It comes off like I'm not man enough to say my mind or say anything mean to anybody, so I'm just nice to people all the time. And when, people, when those people are nice to everybody all the time, nobody even treats them as nice. Because they're just like, oh, it's disingenuous. Oh, he's just nice for an outcome. Or he's just nice to, like, to win people over or whatever, right? Funny enough, though, if there's a guy who's a bit of an asshole, say you had like a dickhead boss who comes in and he's like negative to people, negative to people, negative to people, negative to people, and then one day he says, you know, that was really good work. <laughs> How do you feel about when he tells you it was really fucking like really good work? Feels, feels really good, right? It actually means more. In fact, this probably here registered for you more than all of this. Okay? Um, and so when all you do is, is spike positively all the time, when you're just like, Mr. Like, oh, I love you. You're so wonderful. Oh, I like you. Let's do this. Let's have a date. You just become very, or like, you're so beautiful. I love your dress. It becomes boring. It becomes disingenuous. And actually, it looks manipulative. It looks like you're doing it to get an outcome. However, when you mix it up and you show some negatives in there, when you occasionally do some negative polarity, then the positive polarity actually has meaning. Right? So what you'd like to do with a girl is just have this lovey-dovey interaction where it's like, you're great, I'm great, we're great together, let's have a great time. But if you just start off doing that, it's meaningless, it's disingenuous. So you actually have to have some negative spikes in order for the positive spikes to have meaning. Yeah. Okay, so I guess this is where it kind of comes into the whole like, you know, frame and everything. It's like when you're talking to a girl, like sometimes it's like you, you see those positive things and obviously you talk about it, but sometimes it's like, okay, I don't really, I'm not really seeing a negative to like, you know, <coughs> to kind of go out like how you use some general like that to be general instead of like mm -hmm. doing it as a button, as a technique. Right. Um, so there's two ways to look at it. One way to look at it is I am doing it to be genuine. Like I'm doing it to make my positive mean more if you really want to do that. The other way to do it though is I'm doing it just to play. Like, do you have good friends that you clown with? Yeah. Right. I make fun of my friends more than I make fun of strangers. For sure, like, I, I wouldn't bother making fun of a stranger. So the very fact of making fun of someone doing that negative stuff, it is playful and it is the nature of the interaction, right? And so when, when you do tease a girl, it shouldn't be because I want to give her a negative emotion or because I want a negative spike or manipulator. It should be because when you do that, it is more fun for everybody. It, it adds more, rich, more richness to like what's going on. Um, so that, that's kind of how you want to be looking at it. Um, and just look at it as like being genuinely playful. It's like, for example, um, have you ever um, been in bed with a girl and maybe like a girl probably wouldn't do this the first, first time you fuck her, but like you've slept with her a few times and then you know she wants it and you kind of like tease her a little bit and make her wait a little bit just because, right? Now, isn't making her wait like mean? Yeah. Kind of, but it also makes it better for her too, right? It makes yeah. her want it more. Right? Yeah. Same thing. It's just kind of part of knowing the dance. So you're doing it as like as the dance and the experience, not in a manipulative way. That make sense, yeah. right? Um, and you can even give it right back too. You'd be like, "You're so beautiful." She's like, "Oh, I'm just I'm just fucking with you. You look awful today." No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. You look great. Come here, right? And hug her or whatever, right? So just giving her that giving her that roller coaster of emotions, it means more than if it's just static emotion, right? Another way of looking at it too is girls don't notice. This is kind of weird too. Girls don't notice emotion per se. They notice changes in emotion. So, and this is weird. So say that you go into a really high energy environment where the girl's having a great time and you're having a great time too and then it gets a little bit less great. She's probably like, okay, well, it's nice meeting you, bye, and run off, even though it's still really great. 
Whereas on the other hand, if you're in a really low energy environment and she's having a really, in a really bad mood and you pick her up just a little bit, she's like, oh, this is getting better. And she's happy to stick with you, even though it's actually inherently worse than that other one was, right? Because they notice the change, they notice the difference. So you have to give them that change. If you just do this, if your set just look like this, you go to the top and go like this, it feels exactly the same as this to them. So just understand that's the communication, right? That's, how, that's just how you communicate with girls is flirtation is part of it. It's just the nature of it, right? And I mean, maybe, possibly you could get some results without flirtation if you do a lot of other things right and you have high value for other reasons and you're really attractive and good in bed or something, but like, it's pretty hard. Flirtation's a big part of, of game, right? So anyway, that's push-pull. Um, and you wanna have, obviously, the positives and the negatives. If you have all negatives all the time, you're just a, a downer. You're a terrible experience. And actually, it can work for a little bit, especially because it'll trigger a girl's sense of injustice and make her wanna validate herself. But if you never give it back, eventually she'll just give up. She'll be like, okay, well, he actually just is an asshole. Or I just can't win with him, so I give up. Right? So the, the negative spikes alone actually can work for a little bit, but at some point you have to give some positive spikes. So you have to give a little bit of encouragement. Right? It's like if you, um, <laughs> it's like if, if you were training it, this is a weird metaphor, but if you were training a dog to come when it's called, and like it comes when it's called and you like feed it every time, eventually like if you ever don't feed it, it'll stop coming when it's called because you broke the pattern. So the pattern got too boring. Um, whereas if you occasionally feed it when it comes and occasionally like slap it in the face, like it'll still keep coming as long as the ratio is okay. Does that make sense? <laughs> it's kind of weird, but whatever. But that's positive and negative spikes, so to speak. <laughs> I don't know. It's a weird metaphor. Um, so that's push-pull. Um, and the, the weird thing is, and this is, this is a kind of a funny thing that happens with, um, do you guys know what classical conditioning is? Yeah? Yes? No? Classical conditioning is like, uh, you guys heard of Pavlov's dog? So like the guy, he feeds his dog. Every time before he feeds his dog, he rings a bell. So what happens is over time, the dog learns to associate the bell with the food. So when you ring the bell, the dog starts salivating. The dog gets hungrier, right? Funny thing about that is if you every single time ring the bell and feed it, ring the bell and feed it, you train the dog to associate the two. But if you, start, if you ring the bell like five times in a row and don't feed it, it will learn that the pattern is broken and it will just stop coming. But if you like ring the bell and feed it like 60% of the time, but not all the time, like sometimes you do, sometimes you don't, more often than not you do, then if you don't feed it five times in a row, it'll still keep coming for much longer once you've stopped because it knows that sometimes you don't. It doesn't feel the break in the pattern. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. That's actually what push-pull does as well, is it, it is kind of addictive. Like people are addicted to variable payouts. That's why people gamble too. That's why like sometimes I win, sometimes I lose when I pull the slot machine. That's why it's so addictive is that variable payout. It makes it unpredictable. So that also helps too. You're kind of like addicting a girl to the experience a little bit. All right, um, so that's push-pull. Um, the other one, is it this way? How far back is this one? Damn. Okay, and the last one is disqualification. Disqual disqualification is actually when you do the opposite of what a low-value guy would do. So a low-value guy would try and convince the girl all the reasons he's good for her. Right? I'm good for you because I'm you know, tall and smart and have good grades and uh, I make good money and uh, I'm, I work out really hard. And as soon as you're trying to convince somebody of something, you're automatically in a low value frame. As soon as you're selling, you're lower value than if you're the decider. Okay? Um, so anytime you're qualifying yourself, you're of low value. So the opposite of that is if you're disqualifying yourself. Right? So if you say to a really hot girl, you and I won't get along. A real true 10. How often does she genuinely hear that from someone? Not very often. The only time she ever hears it is if it's from like a pickup guy, and most of them are uncalibrated, so it usually comes off weird, right? So basically, like she's not hearing that. She's not getting the disqualification. And so when you do disqualify, what are you saying? You're saying, I have so much abundance that I'm willing to lose this interaction. And when you're talking to a really hot girl, that doesn't happen for her. It truly sets you apart, because the only guys that are abundant enough to be willing to lose a hot girl are the guys that are in that 1% that have all the hot girls, right? So by the nature of pushing her away, you're conveying you're exactly the type of guy she wants. On top of which, you're giving her a reason to want to take action. So you're motivating action and convincing her you're that really high value guy. So that's why disqualification works. And push-pull has that same nature, because push-pull, it's not a full disqualification, but the negative spike, the negative polarity is a disqualifier, okay? So this is conveying high value, okay? I see some confused faces right now. So does anybody have questions on that? I feel like there are a couple. Yeah, everybody gets it? 
Cool, awesome. Okay, so push, pull, and disqualification. These are excellent outer game tactics that also are pretty much, they work in any situation. There's no, like there are some outer game tactics that are very situational. They work in this case, don't work in that other case. These are extremely generalizable, and if you do them, you will get tremendous results. So talk loud virtually always. Statements, not questions, or at the very least, convey your personality and sort of um, introduce your frame rather than trying to get into hers, right? Assume the burden, convey who you are. Lead, 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 lead. Even if it's pointless, even if you don't know where you're going, lead. All right, there's, um, uh, some, uh, there's a, a infield that I used to show a lot where basically I'm, I'm taking a girl on a date, I met her in the park, I'm taking her on a date, and um, she's asking where it is. And I'm like, oh, it's just there, it's just, it's just there and there. And then I get up, I'm on the phone, and I get up and start walking, right? And I had no idea where we were going, none. I actually had found this place on the map, but we we're in the middle of this park, and I didn't know which way north, south, east, or west was. So I know like it's here on the map, we're in the park, but I don't know which direction out of the park to go. But instead of sitting there and like being like, oh, well, I'm not sure which direction, where should I go? Let me think about it and figure it out. I'm just like, oh no, it's this way, come on. And I start walking. Turns out we walked the completely wrong way out of the park. And then after we got out of the park, I'm like, so which way is north? And they're like, that way. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. So we just go that way and that way. Meanwhile, I'd gone directly south, <laughs> right? But the point was, it didn't matter that I didn't know where I was going. It didn't matter that I led the wrong direction, had to turn around. It was the act of leading and being sure of myself that convinced her it was okay, okay? So leading for its own sake has value. Um, frame control, get into good frames and make sure your frame control is subtle. We'll talk a lot about this one tomorrow. This is gonna be huge for tomorrow. Um, and then push, pull, and disqualification. Absolutely good, you have to give her some negative polarity because otherwise all the positive doesn't mean anything. Also because whenever you push away, that actually does communicate high value. Communicates a willingness to lose, yeah. Sorry, is there ways that you can practice disqualification, like I can get better and practice disqualification any way that you learned it? Um, I practice it a lot in set. Yeah. Yeah, um, beyond that, if you really want to, here's an exercise you could do for push-pull. Um, or push pull and disqualification, but it's more for push pull. Flip on a TV or flip on YouTube or whatever. First video you see, first person you see, say the first thing that comes to mind. And then, if it was positive, follow it up with a negative. If it was negative, follow it up with a positive. Right? So, for example, I could be like, you're very attentive. Clearly, you need a lot of help. Right? Does that make sense? Right? So, the first thing is a positive that I said, so then follow it up with a negative. Or I'd be like, this guy in the back, I love your jacket. It's very fucking like, um, what are those guys that shot up the school? It's like them, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> I forget what they were called. But you know what I'm saying? Like, so it's a positive and then a negative. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the idea is you just say the first thing that comes to your mind and then adjust it. And again, it's, it's a TV or it's YouTube, so you don't worry about offending them, yeah. right? Yeah. Just spit words. Just make it a habit. And then you get to the point where you could theoretically do positive and negative, like North Carolina, it's a good school, but um, you know Duke's Duke's better. I'm sorry, I have to oh, tell you. you. Oh fuck you. So I like that. I like that because you have attitude, but clearly you need to learn to use your words a little bit better. But it's cool though. I mean, I appreciate that. You're trying though. You're trying, and I appreciate effort. Intelligence is better, but effort's good, right? So positive, negative, positive. So you should eventually be able to do like push, pull, push, pull, push, pull. Just ad nauseum and get to that level. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Cool. <laughs>